Souls Theater Day. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie Osborne. I'm the founder of No Plays, which is a new organization based in New England, promoting new works by emerging writers. No Plays! We're, yeah, and we're particularly interested in young emerging female writers. Um, we are very excited to have our first production in collaboration with 365 Women a Year, an international playwriting coalition involving over 200 writers who wrote, over the course of this year, hundreds of plays, each featuring at least one of 365 historical women who changed the world. <laughs> We're also very excited to be hosting this event at Bennington, featuring works from four Bennington playwrights, two alum, and two st current students. Uh, the playwrights are Shellen Lubin, Maya Dia, uh, Natalie Osborne, and Catherine Weingarten, who is unfortunately not with us in person, but certainly in spirit. Um, special thank yous to Matt Scott, uh, to Media Relations for helping us get the equipment, to the Bennington Drama Department, and afterwards we invite you to stay. We're going to have a quick, after the readings, we're going to have a reception, and you have the chance to mingle with actors and playwrights and learn more about the project. You can follow 365 Women a Year on Twitter and Facebook, and we encourage you to do so, as well as No Plays. And if you're interested in signing up for our mailing list, it's right over there. Um, and thank you all for coming. And also, all the plays you're going to see performed tonight are going to be available for purchase on Indie Theater Now. So if you like what you see and you want to have a copy of it on your computer, you can do that. that will, those will be available soon. Thank you all so much for coming, and please enjoy the show. Feelin' Lonely by Katherine Weingarten. It's directed by Natalie Osborne, and the historical woman is Elizabeth Bishop. We are in John's office. John is sitting at his desk. Elizabeth enters. Hey, thanks for meeting me. No problem. I hope my essay was, like, okay. Oh, it was fine. Well, that's good to hear. Actually, I was kidding. It was awful. Here, sit down. What do you mean it was awful? I wrote for like 10 hours last night. My roommate almost threw a bed lamp at me because I kept writing. Probably should have gone to the library and not sat on her bed in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair looks very nice today, Lizzie. Forgot to mention that. Thanks, I kind of think it looks like a hot mess. Like a hamster ran through my hair. C correction, a, a drunk hamster ran through my hair. <laughs> well, I disagree. <laughs> okay. I've uh, been looking for your transcripts. Oh no, you're serious? I don't test well. Oh, well, I can see that, Miss Bishop. <laughs> it says here that you want to study music. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I wasn't good though, so, oh well. Oh, I'm sure you were good. Listen, <laughs> is there any way I can rewrite my essay? I, I promise it will be better. You're talking a lot and all I hear is blah, blah, blah. Oh, that sounds bad. I usually am pretty shy. I don't know why I'm talking so much. Maybe because I'm nervous, but I'm happy to be here. School rocks. I love Vassar. Your tie is looking really good. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> I do love compliments. You're welcome. Do you want to be in this class, Elizabeth? Because ad drop hasn't officially ended. I do. I love that all we do is look at poets no one's heard of before. I find that fascinating and perfect and just super duper interesting. You know, it's not too late to switch back to music. I really think I'd make an awful music student. I threw a flute at one of my classmates one time because he was pissing me off. <laughs> that sounds really aggressive. <laughs> yeah, it was. Kind of out of character. I'm a really nice chick. I'll take your word for it. No, I really am. Ah. Uh, 
you could date one of the poets in our curriculum, who would it be? That's an odd question. You're an odd question. <laughs> Never mind. Just pick one and tell me why, and I might let you write your paper again if I like your answer. We're only reading male poets. And? Pointing it out. <laughs> and your answer? I have to pee. Hold it. Okay. Why are you having so much trouble picking a poet? Is it because you never really read any of the reading? Maybe because you don't really care about this class at all. I'm starting to, I'm getting pretty nervous. Can you stop looking at me like that? Your eyes look all freaky and intense and like a fat evil spider or something. I take it you can't think of someone. Um, fine, no, I can. I guess I find Jumbus Johnson a bit intriguing because he wrote a bunch of, a lot about the sea, which I find pretty turbulent. So if he asked you on a date, you would say yes? Yeah, I think I would. Also, I like how he didn't really talk to anyone. He just lived on a sailboat his whole life, just traveling and listening and watching and living and, and traveling and... Do you imagine how beautiful that would be? Well, that's a nice answer. Thanks. I think I might let you rewrite your paper. Yay! You know, it's pretty lonely being a faculty member here. There's not, there's not too many of us, and we're, we really stick to ourselves. I've noticed. Although, to tell you the truth, that sounds kind of fun. I wish ran less random shit talked to me. Well, it's not nice. It's just lonely. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's okay. You sure? Why are you, um, telling me? talk to? I don't know. You're a woman. Don't women like hearing people's issues because they're kinder than men? That sounds kind of simplistic. Whatever. Well, well, I'm sorry to hear that you feel this way. It's okay. I guess sometimes I, I feel lonely too. Because like, I feel like I think so much, you know, and others don't as much, and I have all these thoughts, and I just see everything, and I wish I didn't notice. Sorry to hear that. It's okay. I'm glad you're gonna let me make up my paper. Might let you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Do you think I have big hands? My <laughs> colleagues say that they're small. I hate that. No wonder I'm lonely. God. <laughs> well, why don't you feel them and you can see? Sure? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, this is nice. I love how school is fun. I'm so happy to be learning. <laughs> I like this class. Good. Good to know. Class is a great school. Yeah, totally. <laughs> End of play. <laughs> Chicano, Chicano, Ria and Flo sit across from one another, far enough apart that if they stretched out their arms, their fingers would not touch. They lift their arms. They then move back and forth, slowly, as though they are each on one opposite end of a seesaw. The rules of breath. When the Chicano, Chicano moves up, Z inhales. When Z moves back down, Z exhales. They sit stand up. They begin with their tongues stretched out of their mouths. The masculine is el. El. Formal. Uh, usted. Familiar. Tu. Roll your R's. Can I? Can you? Rrr. Not too long. Gloria. 
feminine. La. I don't want to start over. Good chair. This chair is feminine. The feminine. La. Por favor. La. Good. Bueno. Right. <laughs> la. Transition. They are children. If I were a snake, I'd twist and turn around your body, in the middle of your body, around your panza. If I were a body wrapped by a snake, I would laugh out all the air in my body. If I were a snake wrapped around your body, around your panza, then you can't laugh, because my body would push out all the air in your but body. But if I were a body and you were a snake, then I would be able to get my hands, my fingers and my hands and grab them around your body, your snake body, and pull you off my body. But if I were a snake, I'd be a really strong snake. But if I were a body, I'd be a really strong body. So you wouldn't be able to grab me with your hands and your fingers because I'll be wrapped around your body and your panza and your hands and your fingers. What if my tongue were a snake? <laughs> huh? What if my body were a body, but my tongue were a snake? That would be weird. And I would stretch out my tongue, but it's not really a tongue. It would be one really long snake that lived inside my body, coming out from inside my throat, from inside my lungs, and my tummy, and my liver, if I still have a liver, and from my poop intestines. Oh, no! My teacher said that my poop intestine is 20 feet long, so why can't something else be hiding inside my body? Like a snake. One big, large, 20, 100 foot long snake. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> is that how much tongue is in a cow? My mommy tries to get me to eat lengua, and I say, Ew, no, that's the tongue. I know it's the tongue. Papa told me. <laughs> not the cow. Not the cow body. Is your snake going to eat me? No. My snake is really nice. That's good. Because my snake is probably going to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> my snake wants to come out of my mouth and wiggle around and dance and let out its tongue. Oh. Oh, oh. And do this, do this. Yes, my snake will say <laughs> And my snake will tickle. I love tickles. Tickle that. Go like this. <laughs> Rio walks two fingers up their arm. <laughs> yeah, up my arm and my neck. My snake will do that. And my snake will lick your cheek <laughs> and your armpits. Yeah. Oh no, my armpits tickle. And the bottom of your feet. Oh, those tickle too. And your knees. <laughs> And your and 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 your vagina. turned on by boyfriends who tried it, but it's never, never been a thing for me. Can I just look at you then? Oh, sure, yeah. Lo moves in between Rio's legs. Your vagina, it's, it's really beautiful, you know that. Really? Why? The lips and the shape and the hair, I really like your hair and your tits. You don't mind the, the stretch marks in between my thighs and the scars? No. I've looked with the mirror. I've seen the weird round spots and the whole region is just big, brown, and puffy. Puffy like it's swollen. No, it's beautiful. I think it's scary. It's scary like I'll put a mirror to it to see it, and it's so brown like, like it's dirty, and I stretch the puffy lips to the side to try to see the pink inside of it. Like there must be pink, pink trapped inside the brown. But there's no pink, just red. It feels like red. Like a light red. You seem to be embarrassed about it. I don't know if I'm embarrassed. Any of it. Just be proud of it. I think it's beautiful. And you are beautiful. I think you are a beautiful chica. What? Chica. Lo tickles Rhea. Oh, shut up. Rhea hits Lo lightly. Shut up, Jew boy. Oh, uh, what? I'm not Jewish. <laughs> really? You're not? No. Oh. <laughs> I thought, I mean, you're, you're circumcised. I mean, I guess a lot of Americans are circumcised. Sorry, 
It's just that it only stuck with uncircumcised people. Oh, and those people were definitely Americans, like they were, you know, like me, like definitely Americanized people. But yeah, uh, I don't know why they weren't circumcised. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it, I'm not offended, I'm just not Jewish. <laughs> Thanks, I'm sorry, I don't know why I called you that. I said, don't worry. They make out a little. Did you not call me Chica, though? Oh, yeah, totally. That was just a joke. Thanks. I don't think of you that way. Love kisses Rhea. Rhea doesn't kiss love. What? You're like your vagina, brown on the outside, but pink on the inside. Rhea softly pushes Glow away from her. Rhea's mmm gets louder. Transition. Glow is back to a female voice. An older female voice than Rhea's female voice. Why didn't you teach me Spanish? Why? Why? Why didn't you teach mom Spanish? Why? Why didn't you make grandpa speak Spanish? He knows it. He just thinks he's not good enough at it, right? But at least he can speak it. He would have been better. It would have been better if you both spoke it with your kids. Then you could have practiced. And then mom would speak Spanish, and I would speak Spanish. Real Spanish. Home Spanish. Our Spanish. Chicano Spanish? Don't you know? Job applications, job qualifications, they say, they say bilingual now. Did you know that? They look at our name, they look at my face, and they expect, and I can't. How am I supposed to get a job? How am I supposed to represent my people, way, group, if I... And I can't even help younger kids, younger generations who need the education that I had because I can't speak Spanish to their parents. What good is a college education and degree and all that money, all the money that we have that we didn't spend, that, that we didn't have, that we spent on me, for us? If I, do you understand? If I don't, then I can't represent what they want me to represent. And then I won't have a job. And if I don't have a job, then I just look like another brown, lazy Mexican. You're American, mijo. <laughs> oh, cheapers, peepers. I, Dios mio, my goodness. Did I say mijo again? You know what I meant. Mija. You're American, mija. La. Transition. Ria is speaking to the audience. Glo is speaking to Ria. Cut off my tongue. Cut off my tongue, Gloria. What good is it if I... Don't give in, mi Brigitte. What is Brigitte? Tighten your belt and jerk. Cut off my tongue and pull out whatever is behind it. Your lineage is ancient. Your roots, like those of the mystic, firmly planted, digging underground toward that current, the soul of Tierra Madre, your origin. Origin. Yes, mi cousin, your people were raised in those ranches here in the valley near the Rio Grande. You descended from the first cowboy, the vaquero, right smack in the border in the age before the gringo when Texas was Mexico. I've never been to Texas. I've never been to Mexico. Over in Los Ranchos, Los Vergeles, Jesus Maria, Rocky Lelang. Strong woman reared you, my sister, your mom, my mother, and I. I love my grandma, but my abuela's tongue is poison, so I've been told. And yes, they've taken our land, not even the cemeteries. I jog around home, Evergreen Cemetery sometimes. Where they bur buried Don, Don Urbano, your great-great-grandfather. My great-great-grandfather was born here. He makes me fifth generation. Hard times like father we carry with curved backs we walk. Walk, walk on which land? Can home be taken twice? But they will never take that pride of being Mexicana, Chicana, Tejana, nor our Indian woman's spirit. I don't know where my anger and my pride come from. Can a Chicana be machismo? And when the gringos are gone. My employers and my coworkers and my teachers and my friends. See how they kill one another. Here we'll still be like the horned toad and the lizard, relics of an earlier age, survivors of the first fire age and quinto sol. Perhaps you'll be dying of hunger, hunger as usual. Soy vegetariano, but I still eat tacos de lengua. <laughs> but we'll be members of a new species, skin tone between black and bronze, second eyelid under the first, with the power to look at the sun through naked eyes, and the lies we keep are very much alive. I want to be full but I don't want them to see the size of my tummy, my panza. If only I could get a Victorian corset and wrap it around my panza to teach it to be shaped like a woman is supposed to be shaped. With the cloth and the 
leather and the boning would break off as soon as I laughed. Yet, in a few years or centuries, la raza will rise up, tongue intact, carrying the best of all the cultures, that sleeping serpent, rebellion, revolution, will spring up. Like old skin will fall, the slave ways of obedience, acceptance, silence. Like serpent lightning will move, little woman, will you be? Rhea, inhale. Slow, inhale. When they run out of breath, the Chicana Chicana leave their tongues hanging out of their mouths. End of. End de, end de fe, end de la obra, end. Making Frankenstein. Prologue. Mary's Nightmare. Mary. She stands next to a table that has a dead frog and an electric prong on it. A voice is heard from offstage. Our nervous system, like those of this frog's, are made of electric currents. Yes. Once dead, the currents can still be reactivated. Life by a pulse of electricity through the body. Rebirth. This gentleman is the greatest achievement in modern science. Nature. We can push the limits of the natural world. Boundaries. And as the march of progress continues. Abuse. We might, at some point, be able to reanimate the dead completely. God. To create life. Man. I will now demonstrate. Claire. Mary shocks the frog with the electric prong. Instead of its legs moving, the frog wails like an infant. Lights out. Scene one. Lights up on Dr. Frankenstein working on his monster. He's almost finished. Mm. Yes, yes, that's it. Mm. Well, it's, it's alive! <laughs> no, no, absolutely not! Lights up on Mary Shelley. She is sitting at a typewriter on the other side of the stage. She leaves the typewriter and walks over to Frankenstein. What? That line you just used. What about it? It was dreadful. I thought it was working very well in the scene. No! It wasn't working at all. It was completely stupid. But it really captured the moment. What moment? What are you talking about? No, it's all wrong. I don't understand. <laughs> Why? Dr. Frankenstein would never say that. With all due respect, madame, I think I have a better understanding of what Frankenstein would say, or wouldn't say, because considering I am Frankenstein. <laughs> Mary glares at him. Frankenstein realizes he's made a big mistake. <laughs> I'm sorry, I... I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have. I am your writer, sir. I will decide what lines you will or will not say. I made you. I am your master. You have an understanding. Yes, Miss Mary. Good boy. Now shall we take it from the top? Y you know what? I'm sorry, but, but no. I, I cannot work under these conditions. I just need a moment to step out. And Where do you think you're going? You get back here and finish this story. We are on a limited schedule. The contest is tomorrow evening, and we're not even halfway through the story. Frankenstein? Frankenstein? Frankenstein! Too late. Frankenstein has already left. Mary stuffs her hand into her mouth and screams. <laughs> she takes a deep breath and tries to go back to writing. Percy enters the stage. There's something frustrating you about. Do you mind? No, not at all. You know that it's not what I meant. Not planning on coming to bed tonight, I see. Can't. It was nightmare. What about? Frog legs and dead children. Oh. Mary. Nothing. Never mind. I'm tired and I'm asleep. Mary, do you want to talk? Percy, I'm really not in the mood right now. Here. <laughs> Why frog's legs? 
I am trying to concentrate. If I did this to you while you were composing a poem, I would never hear the end of it. And hit me, though. Oh. You must have overheard us talking about the galvanism experiment. The one where scientists use electricity to reanimate frog's legs. Well, Byron and I certainly didn't mean to give you any nightmares. No, it's fine. I didn't think you were so easily startled. I'm not. Then why do you seem so... Don't distract me, please. I only have a limited time to get it down before it slips away. What slips away? The nightmare! Oh, so you're using the monster as your muse now. Not the monster, the man. Well, I guess he also is the monster. They're the same person. Oh, stop distracting me and hit the back. I was yeah. only trying to have a conversation. It seemed more like a blatant act of sabotage. Well, you said... Do you really think that I would... Mm -hmm. Are you calling me a cheater? No, but you just called yourself one. Yeah. Very amusing. I'll have you know that I do not need to cheat. I have already written my story. It is terrifying. And I am without a doubt going to beat both you and Byron, so there. Well, you certainly <laughs> sound confident. I'm always confident. I can't help being a genius. <laughs> what was that? Oh, nothing. I like hearing you laugh. When I'm not busy chasing down mad men, or bad men. We are talking. I meant about her. Her is vague. You know who I mean. Who? Well, not the frog's legs. <laughs> no. No? No. Well, I do. Go, I need to write. Mary. No, Percy, enough. Stop trying to destroy my nightmares. Wait, no, I didn't. You know what I meant. No, I, I don't. Do you want to be left alone with your monsters and nightmares? Yes. Well, fine. Percy starts to leave. Percy, what wait. Is what is it? This is how I'm able to deal with this, with her being gone. Her is vague. <laughs> Not frog's legs. Just like this, then? Alone? Yes. Well, then what do you need me for? You can make me coffee if you'd like. <laughs> Fine. Percy goes to make coffee. Mary writes. Percy re-enters. Mary? Yes? It's good. Very good. Brilliant, actually. This? <laughs> yes. I'm sure you'll win. Oh, what about your terrifying nightmare? I didn't write it. I couldn't think of a damn thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mary smiles. Percy smiles back. Percy leaves. Mary writes. Frankenstein re-enters. He reads over Mary's shoulder until she, until she turns around and stares at him. Have a jolly holiday? Um, well. <laughs> Hurry up. We haven't got all night. Yes, Miss Mary. They cross over to the laboratory side of the stage. Now, where were we? Lights out. Epilogue. Mary's dream. Lights yes. up on Mary and another woman. Death. The woman is very beautiful, but in a natural sort of way, like an angel. Death. Life. Grief. Joy. Loss. Gain. Glory. Science. Fiction. Science fiction. Daughter. Mother. I love you. I love you too, sir. End. After the Thin Man by Shellen Lubin, directed by Maya Via. The two historical women are Stella Adler and Sylvia Gassel. Sylvia Gassel, played by Victoria Nation, and Stella Adler, played by Thea Dillon. <laughs> Stella Adler is around 40 years old. She is dramatic, aristocratic, from a theatrical family, Yiddish theater royalty. So there is definitely a Lower East Side Jewish girl in there as well. Sylvia Gassel is 19 years old, also a Lower East Side Jewish, gir a Jewish girl, also well-studied and accomplished in the theater and acting. She admires and looks up to Stella, but is not awed by her as others are. Sylvia is extremely down to earth. <laughs> when lights come up, it's a bare studio space with scattered chairs. Stella is sitting in one, bowed over, as if weeping. Sylvia enters, throws her coat over a chair, sees Stella, is surprised, is about to speak, stops herself a few times, 
is afraid to speak, is angry, is afraid again, then finally says something. What are you doing here? What kind of a way is that to greet me? What are you doing here? Morning. I'm serious. Why are you back in New York? Why are you in this studio of all places? To save you. <laughs> save me? From what? Acting exercises? Is that what he's calling them now? No, <laughs> that's what I'm calling them. Him? You mean Lee? I can't stand to even hear his name. Well, the whole big live man himself will be here in 10 minutes. God, come outside with me before he gets here. I need to talk to you. About what? I can't tell you in here, not in this room. Come. No, I have to prepare. Why are you even in New York? I thought you lived in LA now. I don't live anywhere now. You're homeless too? Yes, I'm homeless and in mourning. <laughs> Did someone really die? Me. <laughs> Right, not too dramatic, are you? Isn't that our profession, to be dramatic? For Ibsen, Chekhov, Strindberg, to be dramatic with the lives they created, not our petty little lives, remember? Did I say that? That our lives aren't important? Yes, you did. Mine is. Oh, so that petty little thing is just for the rest of us. Right. Not the Empress Adler. Are you mocking me? Maybe. How did you die? The thin man killed me. I thought he was going to make you a star. It was a ruse. He lured me into his lair just to turn on me and murder me. I thought the thin man was the one who solves the crimes, not commits them. Actually, the thin man was the suspect in that first film, but the name caught on, so they just keep using it. So Hollywood. What does it matter if it makes sense, as long as it sells? Okay, but you did say you weren't coming back until you were a movie star. Something akin to that. And you, ne and you said you were never walking back into this room. One way or another, they all destroy you. Here, they call it creating a family. There, they chew you up and spit you out. Oh, please. That's what they do. Maybe to starstruck hopefuls. Everyone. Pretty little waifs. Everyone. I'm excited. I was excited to see you. your first major role on film as a swanky society sweetheart. Isn't that how you describe her? The shadow of the thin man. That's the film you made, right? Oh, Sylvia, you do not want to see it. It's garbage. It, Harry turned Dashiell's story into phony, gimmicky garbage. And the director had everyone pretending everything. Even Asta, the dog, overacted. <laughs> <laughs> so, you think he can just come back? He casts a long, long shadow. Your thin man? Both. Mine and yours. Mine? Lee Strasberg is not mine! You're still in his class. I come once a week at four on Thursdays to work with the best. Well, at 4.30 to prepare. Four? I, I thought 4.30. It was always 4.30. They start earlier now, more of us in shows. Need time to get to the theater for half an hour. Half an hour is never enough. I didn't say that I get to the theater at ha half hour. You know how much time I need to prepare before going on stage. Everyone needs that much time to prepare. You're just one of the few who actually take it. Which is why I'm here now, to prepare, and you're not letting me. I'll help you. What are you working on? Juliet. In that dress. I came right from work. Sylvia, Sylvia, you cannot begin to feel like Juliet in a woolen A-line skirt and loafers. Don't you remember anything I showed you? Yes, you do need me to save you. Don't you have a rehearsal skirt and character shoes? Don't turn this on me. It sounds like you're the one who needs to be saved. I can save myself. But you couldn't in LA. I'm not a magician. But I can save myself from being destroyed by a fantasy once I know that it is one. And LA is a fantasy. Our little lives may be pedestrian, but they have the artifice without the art. And there's no place for us. You know what the name of the maid was in the film, Nick and Nora's maid? The character or the actress? The character. Go ahead, guess. Uh, Balula. No, Jemima. Stella. <laughs> Stella. Every time anyone called for the maid, I thought they were calling me. You are anything but the maid. Here, once, I was Yiddish theater royalty, the daughter of the great Adler, taking her rightful place on the throne, holding out her hand as if she held a precious object. I held the whole world in my hand from a stage. And when I can get the audience to see what is in my hand, 
trust me that I believe it and feel it and that they are safe to believe it and feel it as well, then I can go anywhere, anywhere at all, and take them right along with me, but not in Hollywood. There's nothing to grab hold of. I can't get deep enough. Grab hold of the roles. The world is a place. We saw it in the world of the film. They just wanted me to look glamorous and say the lines mysteriously. They just wanted the camera to love me. I'm sure it did. It's a cold, unfeeling audience, a hunk of metal. Even when it's loving you, it gives you nothing. Well, if you're here five minutes from now, you're going to see a whole lot of people who will give you less than nothing. Then come with me. Now, please. Tell me why. Not here. Please, we need to go. You're right. I need to get you somewhere else. I'll make it worth your while, I promise. Sitting down. I'm not going anywhere until you're straight with me. Becoming Claire Porter, the character she played in the Thin Man film. Isn't she sweet? <laughs> me? If I can hold my own in, this gang sweet is not a word I'd use. I found it a bit too brutal. Gave me a headache. Oh, I get it. That's your swanky society sweetheart, isn't it? Swanky society sweetheart who is really a trashy ex-convict. That one scene was almost, almost something. When she got so infuriated, she lost her pretentious upscale manners and accent and revealed her true colors. Even Bill Powell started to get good in that scene. I teased it right out of him. You can get anything out of any actor. So why are you working with me? I'm not. I just come for the playmates. And he doesn't intimidate me. That must drive him crazy. You're my beacon, remember? I was planning to follow you. You were going to take Los Angeles by storm, and then I was going to follow in your footsteps. If, if you're here, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Plays? Yes, but you know, we, we can't do it. I can't, you can't. They won't let us. Your dear Bo, <laughs> he can, maybe. Joel? Joel Friedman. You really think so? Maybe he has too much of an ethnic look to him, like Sandy Meisner. Your brothers can. No, they can't. But for different reasons. Right, for different reasons. Life beats the soul out of you. The theater gives it back. I live, breathe, and die for the theater because it is the only place in the world where I get all used and all used up. The scene play. Exactly. Only in the theater can we see the world so clearly, feel it so deeply. The theater shows all truth, the truth of every society, of each generation, the truth of humanity never completely recognized until it is brought to life and set before us on a stage. There is nothing else for us. Gesturing to the empty room. For any of us. Don't include them. Most of them don't even understand. Lee doesn't understand. Understand what? The method? I know that's what you were always fighting about. It's not a method, Sylvia. We were always fighting because Lee has it all wrong. All that emotional memory is garbage. Not at all what Constantine intended. When I ran into him in Paris, we wrote it all down. Stanislavski couldn't believe that Lee was teaching his first exercises as a whole acting technique. They were intended as a possible first step in an actor's development. One step, if necessary, the theater is not about our own emotional memories. We must create these marvelous, unique characters, find their reality, their voice, their truth. How could we possibly find any emotional memory in our lives that replicates what, what Oedipus has to contend with when he realizes he has killed his own father and married his mother? Or Hamlet, when he realizes that he alone can save Denmark from his treacherous uncle. Countries at stake, generations of kings and kingdoms on the line. Okay, the method definitely has limitations. Look, Sylvia, I found this quote from Lord Byron in a little bookshop in London, and I've been carrying it around ever since. Taking out a torn piece of paper from her coat pocket. Know thyself. Long enough has that poor self of thine tormented thee. Thou wilt never get to know it, I believe. Thou art an unknowable individual. Know what thou canst work at and work at it like a Hercules. That will be thy better plan. Putting it back in her pocket. It's not a method, it's a journey. And I am an explorer. I need to go into and through jungles where no human has yet been, to plant my flag, stake my claim on as yet unseen, unknown, untouched earth. 
first woman in theater. The first woman to play a woman on stage. That would have been something. The first international theater star, our divine Sarah. My mother, the Bernhardt of the Yiddish theater. The first silent movie star, the first talking movie star, all happened. And I have no more interest in movies anyway. What is left? I feel like your big sister, but the truth is, I could almost be your mother. I want to save you from my fate. I want to keep you from the devastating disappointment I have known. How? Are you going to start a theater? Make it different? No. I... I just, I just need to work, to, to, to act. I need to create characters, to, to love them, even the lost and the miserable. Do they ever let you play the lost and the miserable? Juliet is lost and miserable. Joel helped me find that. She's not usually played that way, but she is. She is not a romantic family fantasy, a, a lost and miserable child. I love finding how they're all lost, miserable, damaged in some way. I'm never as alive as I am when I am in a character on stage. And I'm never as exhilaratingly happy as when they call half hour and I'm sitting backstage in my dressing room, restless and nervous putting on my makeup in some cracked, frameless mirror and getting into the skin of some marvelous character far more interesting and eloquent than me. I wanted to do that in movies, to follow you and do that in movies. They're a carnival, like an old-fashioned melodrama, like the worst of commercial garbage that passes for theater, an evening's pleasant entertainment. But we thought you said... I know that movies are the future, that they will swallow up the theater whole, and they probably will, but not with me, not with me. No, 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 you can't do this to me. We had an intention, we had a plan. You were going to be a first, a, the first real character actress in Hollywood. Don't. Don't what? Don't say that. Spit three times, throw salt over your left shoulder. What are you talking about? I thought we, you, were going to create the first true, renowned, and revered character actress in film. I thought I, I could. I, I... So I could be second. Not so that we could do carnivals, melodramas, musicals, singing, dancing, swimming extravaganzas, so we could do great plays on film. Shakespeare! They're not doing Shakespeare. They're doing cartoons. But they will. If the movies swallow the theater whole, then they will do Shakespeare on film. Then they will do Shakespeare as cartoons. <laughs> what about Shaw, O'Neill, O'Dell? They will turn them all into cartoons. Or worse, they will do to stories what Lee has done to acting and make it all small and puny. Instead of uplifting, it will diminish cultivating some futile notion of reality over vision and imagination, the act of creation, study. That is the key. That is the journey. I don't want to study. I want to work. What will you study? No, no, Sylvia, you misunderstand. They will study me. I will be a teacher. I will be a journeyman. I will go wherever I have to. I want to be one of those journeyman character actors who get to play all kinds of juicy roles, large and small, old and young, playful and dark and bawdy and insane all the time. You're not a man. A journey woman. There are none. Are you not listening to me? I get it. There are none. Well, I will be one anyway. But I need you. I need you by my side. You understand it. You know how to do it. You're one of the very few. Right. That's why I must be a character actor. You won't. You won't work for another hundred years. At the least, none of us will work. Not really. Don't say that. Don't give up. You're too good. I won't give up. I won't. There are no parts for character actresses. You might as well go back to your apartment and have babies. No babies. I want plays. I want to do plays. I see it. Bleak. And Baron, far down the road, they'll keep shutting us out. I can see it. The roles are not being written, and if they are, they're not being produced. Whatever parts they give me, I will do. Table scraps. That is what they will give you. I refuse. So you... I said it. Didn't you hear? 
hear anything I said. I will be a teacher. A teacher? You've got to be kidding. How will you be an empress, Stella, if you're a teacher, a, lo a lowly teacher? And it's my job to see that they don't stay unknown. What is that? What are you saying? One of the lines in the film. The police chief. He had to do so many takes because there was a problem with the camera angle. And I kept hearing him say it over and over again. It got to me. It's my job to see that they don't stay unknown. <laughs> that line kept running through my head by the end all the time. Yes, yes, my job is to see that they do not stay unknown. The words. No, more important than the words, the ideas. Theater itself. It's my job to see that they are not misunderstood, destroyed, that they do not stay unknown. So you'll make them famous. No, don't you see? I will reveal them. I will make them known and felt and brilliant. And I will make myself famous. <laughs> that sounds more like my Stella. <laughs> I will be a teacher of acting, the most celebrated, most admired acting teacher. The burn part of the classroom. No, no of the classroom as stage. I will, in each class, in each session, make theater in order for each and every actor there to truly understand, truly feel what it means to draw the audience into the journey, into the grandest truths of the world, the truths that are greater than reality, those that are revealed in all their glory through art. So you really are deserting me. You are deserting me. I came to take you with me. I'm asking no one else. And do what? Assist, demonstrate, show them how it is done. You can perform all the time, create all the characters for students who will appreciate it. No. What do you want with them? To get to Broadway? At best, they will put you into some meaningless ingenue role that any pretty girl could play. And that will only last a few years. I was counting on you. I was going to follow you. You don't have to follow me. Come with me now. I want to act. We cannot act the way we want. We will teach the men who will get to do it how to do it. Your way. The right way. What about the women? They won't get to do it anyway. What's the matter, the women? How can you dismiss them like that? How can you dismiss me like that? Go home, Sylvia. Angry, pushing her away. Marry your Joel Friedman. Cook dinners, make babies, let them spit up all over you and take your love and life and grow up to hate you anyway. You are gone. You're gone already. I am not gone. You might as well be. You might as well go sell shoes in Kansas if you don't come and teach with me. I am not going to become a teacher. I am not gone. You might as well be. They don't care. Pathetic wisp of nothing. You insignificant little... Stella! What are you saying? You cannot see what is right before you. How can you do anything of value? If you have no value, why bother doing anything at all? Why are you doing this? You're a little Russian Jewish girl, and all you will ever be is a little Russian Jewish girl. You're a little Russian Jewish girl, too. I am a broad. I am a Jewish broad from Odessa. That makes you less gone? As a teacher, I will not be gone. I will not be pushed aside. Not now, not ever. As a teacher. Do you how, hear how ridiculous that sounds? Is that the stand you will make as a teacher? Get out of here, Stella, before the rest of them get here. You don't want to be here when they come, and I am not going with you. Not ever. I'm staying, and I'm working. In the theater. Whatever I have to do, whatever they let me do. Stella leaves without Sylvia, coming down laps as the lights fade out in the room she just left. She is standing in one light that becomes more focused as she speaks. I don't care how it sounds. You will see. As a teacher, that is where I will make my stand. I will make my entrance onto the stage every day, and they will know what it means to command attention. <laughs> my ideas will be treated as they deserve, like pearls. Pearls of wisdom, pearls of insight. I will sit on a throne, a majestic velvet throne, and rule with a staff, a jeweled staff, and an iron fist befitting a warrior queen. And so they will know, will feel, how this is a place of exaltation, not diminishment. Through my rigorous and unrelenting requirements, my students will understand everything there is to know about text and subtext and character.
character and objectives and actions and ideas, and most important of all, about imagination. They will hear me so deeply with their blood that I will get them to hear that deeply in character on stage every time they go on stage. And so they will come to understand how it is that you make theater, how you create a world on stage and live in it. I will be the empress of acting technique here in America, and I will never, never, never be gone. The light fades out slowly on Stella. The end. who have put on this amazing performance. And thank you all again for coming out and supporting the project.